Okay, so we're going to start with the questions. And the first one is, what leadership style does your business follow? Like, how is your business run? Like, autocratic, democratic, human relation styles? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so we actually do not have one specific style. Um, oh. As a CEO, yes, we we did not think, oh, this is how we're going to do, this is the style that we're going to have. But I guess the closest thing would be human, because obviously human come first. Right. Then we follow any type of rule that is under the French regulation, and of course, any type of um, Muslim rule that fall under our school of thought. This is a combination of all of it. Oh, wow. And like, what do like um, the French rules like? Like, what are the French rules? Uh, for example, if we have an intern, there will be some amount of hours that we per week of work that we have to respect. No working, no calling, no texting after hours on the weekends. Um, the company has to refund 50% of the public transportation fees um, for each person for the com commute and all of type those types of rules like okay so the second question is what was the vision for your brand so it will sound sound a little bit cliche but community was the first and main still is the main vision from for the brand every brand nowadays talks about community but being a Muslim brand, it felt absolutely normal for us to want to build a community of sisters that have the same type of values because each modest brand, each Muslim brand, even though we do share common values, they all have their own vibes. And we believe that Les Sultana has a different type of vibes and we wanted to yeah, gather sisters who loved everything girly in cottage. That's really cute and adorable. So how did you guys come up with your designs? Because they're more unique than like um, most like modest brands that I've seen. So uh, as the CEO, I am also the designer and the creative director. So even though I have people helping me when I work on projects, we always have like at least one intern, uh, sometimes two. There are always multiple people and sometimes we have freelancers. I do do 95% of the job. I, and by the job, I mean running the company. So any type of design, any type of story behind the designs is very personal. It's coming from my own background. Usually it's from my childhood here in France. So when I will create a design, I usually will have either a feeling or memory that I want to share. And then I will translate that into a print or a color palette, or I will have first this print or this color palette that I want to do. And together they inspire me a story. And this is how a collection is born. Like it always starts with either a story or with a color. Wow, that's that's really beautiful. Um... Like, can you give me an example of, like, one of your designs that you're one of the stories in mm, one of the designs? For example, so we we have we always have two collections a year. Even though we didn't do uh, for 2024, we took a break. But mm -hmm. we usually have two collections a year. So the spring and summer of 2022 was when we did our first printed collection. So this is when, I'm sorry, I have notifications at the same time. I don't know if it's bothering you. No, um, I can't hear them. Okay, great. Uh, so we, this is when we did the first printed collection. And mm -hmm. um, the collection was called Let Them Eat Cake. It's a reference to uh, a famous sentence that Marie Antoinette was accused of saying, but actually she she hasn't said it. But this sentence still holds a lot of meaning, especially in the French culture. And for example, this is a very intimate collection. 
when you see it from the outside, you only see very pretty floral patterns and pastel colors, sisters in a castle or in a picnic. But the story behind this collection is extremely deep. And I could actually talk about this collection and every single meaning behind it for hours. But for example, the reference to Marie Antoinette is a direct reference to our situations here as hijabis in France. And I I talked in our first issue of the Studio Sultana magazine, I talked about the reference how, uh, with the movie Marie Antoinette from Sofia Coppola. So there are a lot of medium, media, sorry, um, that come together as inspiration and create a story and give meaning to the collections. So the prints and all of that were inspired from Marie Antoinette and from a castle that I visited near my hometown here in France. And it's a mixture of a lot of levels. And we I really felt connected. That might sound weird, but I felt deeply connected to Marie Antoinette in this movie, a movie that I watched when I was 18 in college <clears throat> in my English class. In the movie, mm -hmm. Marie Antoinette is seen only in the castle of Versailles. She, we don't see her outside of the castle. She's living in a bubble. And at the end of the movie, the French citizens are coming to her and with fire and sticks. And pretty much the movie ends there. We never see her downfall. And we felt connected to Marie Antoinette's story in the sense that as hijabis in France, we are some. We can live in a bubble somehow through our hijab and through our community and through the love that we share as sisters. But at the end of the day, the French are still coming with sticks and fire. Yeah. We just don't really show it, just like Sofia Coppola didn't really show it uh, in her right. movie. So that's a very deep... I, again, I could talk about it for hours, but it's very funny because... Our competitors, which like, and I'm not criticizing them. It's just I'm making everything harder for myself. That's it. But our competitors would be like, "Oh, the, here are pretty colors," and me, I'm like, "Here is a history of France and how it will be linked to us and our trauma as French hijabis." I just, I, and then it becomes pretty chimar with floral patterns. But every time I look at those chimar. Every time I, I see those patterns, I just think about the story behind it when I create it. And I just have so much love for this collection and what it means. It's just, I'm just very proud of the story that I tell, even though most people will never really hear that story fully. Mm -hmm. So this is an example of how a collection is born. <laughs> oh, my. wow. That is like, I've never, I never really thought about that. Like when I look at your Alars or Abayas that you guys make, um, I'm always like, oh my god, it's so pretty with all the floral patterns and like the coquette and aesthetic. I never really thought of it like as a as a story. Yes, um, not all collections are that deep, but we have noticed when, for example, the spring and summer 2023. So the collection, the spring and summer collection we did after the year after, it was not that deep, even though it's. It always it's always personal. Every collection that I look at, I know where I was and what state of mind I was at that time. And somehow I just share it with the customers without them knowing. And the spring and summer 2023 was not that deep. It didn't have a big story. And somehow it shows. It's like customers don't know. And yet it still shows because the spring and summer 2022 was more thought out it was more into details and also because of the story of the company itself it was a big moment for our company uh, back then the people received the collection way better in 2022 than they did in 2023 and again autumn winter 2023-24 it was personal again and people loved it again so being personal really works even though people don't always know about it you just give out a better work, I guess. It's like a hidden message. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So what inspired you to start a modest fashion brand? Why did you want to go into modesty? Um, I always was into fashion. I am <laughs> I am born in, in the early 90s. So I'm a millennial and I was raised in this fashion culture. I always wanted to 
um, work in a magazine. Um, and this is why today I have Studio Sultana, my own magazine and being an editor in chief was, is such a blessing. Um, in the early 2000s, 2010s, I had my own blog. Like it was when blogging was something very new. Um, I always, always loved fashion. I always loved buying magazines and cutting them. And this is why today when we do designs and I do a lot of the digital designs as well, every, everything that you will see from the newsletters, the website, it's me behind it. Even if sometimes I will have one or two people helping me with a few details, again, 95% of the job is done by me. But when people do the five remaining percent, it's where the magic happens. I, it wouldn't be as good if I didn't have those people doing the five percent. I really want to give them credit for that. But anyways, um, I, I was always into fashion, and I have. But being an, a child of immigrant here in France, pursuing fashion was not really an option. It didn't feel safe enough, and it isn't. It isn't safe enough. So my parents, being entrepreneurs and having their own business having their own shop. I always knew I wanted to go that route as well. Um, <clears throat> instead, I went to college and I, where I graduated, I have a master's degree in business in international trade where I studied English and Spanish as well. So I went into business and for a few years I was um, working for other companies in France and abroad. I really thought I was going to be working nine to five and giving up on my dream the more I, I advanced in my career. But after a while, I I just was not satisfied with working nine to five, especially in France, where it is almost impossible to work with a hijab. So I decided to quit my job. And back then I was not a hijabi yet. I quit my job. A few months later, I was a hijabi. And a few months again later, I had my own business because for my entire 20s, I just didn't know what I wanted to do, but I just knew I wanted to do something. I wanted to have my brand. I just knew, but I just didn't know what it was going to look like. And then when I became a hijabi, this is where I realized I was like, okay, so th this is why I couldn't do my brand before. I had to be a hijabi first to discover this world, to discover modest fashion truly. And then it just clicked. Le Sultana was born. That's amazing. And like, um, one of my questions, an extra question, but uh, where did you get this like unique name? Like, how did you come up with that? Well, finding a name for your business is one of the hardest part. It is so hard. It's almost impossible, especially for legal reason when you have to, you know, do the copywriting and stuff. But for me, it was just always Le Sultana. It was, it's just... That was it. I did not have any other name ideas. And when I wanted to uh, copyright the name Le Sultana, I actually had issues because there were already too many. Because I, I am fully aware this is not very original. <laughs> <laughs> there are many, many modest brands that have the word Sultana in it. And when I wanted to copyright it, it was just too crowded. So I had, I had this moment where I was like, oh, my God, I will have to drop the name. I will not be able to copyright it. And no other name would fit ever. I just spent days and days trying to find another name. It was, I was always coming back to Le Sultana. So I just went through the legal process and hoped for the best. And Alhamdulillah, we've been copyrighted for like, I think five or six years now, Alhamdulillah. I cannot even remember. I think it's, it's going to be our fifth year in February, inshallah. Inshallah. Um, can you share a strategy that helped you grow? your brand grow and stand out in the fashion industry? So just like when we do the designs, we, or even with our, like the way we handle the business, we don't really have a strategy. <laughs> and I know anyone coming with a business background, the people will be pulling their hair, but that's just not what we do. We want to, our main strategy is our values. That's that's what we focus on. We focus on being original. We focus on our quality. And we are being very patient with our business. We are playing the long game. We don't read. like we don't really want to go viral on social media because every time a video happened to be viral, it actually 
did more harm than good. And we actually took down the few videos that ever went viral on social media. We took them down because it was attracted the wrong type of crowd. We want to really create who is our audience. And we understand that this happens by being organic and by being very, very patient. And we have a very, very strong word of mouth reputation. We built everything on our reputation. They are, when we started back around 2019, 2020, 20 was really when we officially did, but 2019 was when I was doing all the research, the market research and all of that. There is so much competition on the market. It's very crowded. I'm not saying mm -hmm. that if tomorrow you want to start your own business, don't because it's crowded. There is, there is for everybody, but still, it is still crowded. And we understood that we had to, that the main thing that we could have is our reputation. If people could really shop and trust us and know that even if they receive um, a faulty item, even if their parcel gets lost in transit or whatever, if they have any type of issue, and even if they receive something, they're like, oh, I don't really like it, but they will always come back because they loved what happened. They loved the experience. So we focus on all of that. We focus on their trust, on um, on our reputation, on the experience, on being a sultana, what it means to be one. And that is our main uh, strategy, really. Well, that is amazing. I, lo I love that. Um, as a CEO, how do you maintain your personal values while leading a growing fashion brand? So the key word for being a CEO is that I am a Muslim CEO. And that is part of my identity. That is my identity. Both as are linked. So how I am as a Muslim is who I am as a CEO. Um, Les Sultana being a Muslim company, we do follow Muslim rules. And everything that I do, every interactions that I have with customers and more, I always remember that I will be held accountable for what I do. I have to be honest. I have to be trustworthy. Um, business owners have a very special place in Islam. It means that we can have a lot of reward, but the punishment can be also very high. So being a business owner is not something that I take lightly. It's something that I take extremely seriously in a religious point of, point of view. So it really impacts every single aspect of my business. This is why I need to be honest with the people I work with. I need to be honest with the customers. I need to be honest about the products. Um, I need to make sure that everything is trustworthy because I will. I am being held accountable for everything that I do and every decision that I make. So this is how I balance leading a business and being a CEO. It's just all about Islam, really. Wow. <laughs> wow, like... No, I'm sorry. I'm so mesmerized how you just incorporated Islam into like your business life. And you know what? It is one of my biggest dreams to be able to do that as well. Okay. So have you noticed any significant shifts in the way modest fashion is perceived in mainstream fashion circles? Um. Yeah, so we actually don't really pay attention to mainstream fashion and how modest fashion participates because we do believe that we are not really a modest fashion brand. We are more like a Muslim fashion brand. And even fashion, we don't really like that word. It's like more Muslim brand. But it's really hard not to notice that major brands like ASOS or Shein, they've been selling hijabs they, or H&M who have very modest dresses and like modesty is very trendy because most businesses have noticed it's a billion dollar industry. So mm -hmm. we, we have noticed that dressing modestly is easier nowadays. And it's honestly, it's really good. It's really good. Like modesty doesn't belong to Islam and the more women can dress modestly, that's great for them. But we, 
that's not something we really pay attention to. Well, yeah, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, you don't want to be like feeling someone's designs. You guys are very original and unique. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you share a memorable moment or achievement that you made that you have made and you felt proud of of your for your brand or whatever, if you feel comfortable sharing? Yeah, of course. Um, we, I actually have many big, big memories, big moments with the company. For example, when we had our first office here in Paris suburbs and stuff. And <laughs> again, being a child of immigrant and being Muslim and being hijabi, getting an office space so close to Paris is almost impossible, to be honest. So it was a big mm -hmm. achievement. But the reality is the, um, the pride that I get from this business, the happiness that I get from this business is not to sound cliche, is from the everyday life, the very small things that are to me as a CEO, extremely big. Um, recently, someone commented on TikTok and said that they requested our khimar to be part of their Nika gifts. We just, we just found like, someone thinking that our khimar would be that precious. We have sisters sending us photos, telling us that they wore our khimar or jilbabs or even hijabs to their wedding. Uh, some to their, um, to the day they took their shahada at the mosque. We have sisters sending us messages saying that we had the situation, a sister saying that she was dressing less and less modestly and that she was kind of losing her hijab. And then she found our brand and she fell in love with hijab again through our hijab. And then now she's even wearing the khimar or the jilbab. Sister is saying that they, they were just interested in Islam. They were, and we do not pretend to represent Islam or to represent what it is to be a hijabi. We're just being ourselves. We're just being like girls being girls. Uh, we always tell customers who, who con contact us, like do not take... Um, Islam teaching from Instagram and especially from businesses. This is not our place. Um, as a business, we do talk to scholars. We ask questions and we are trying to be as responsible as possible. But at the end of the day, everybody is uh, responsible for their own hijab. But our pride really comes from those moments from sisters sending us mes messages and saying that we had a positive impact in their hijab journey, that we are part of very important moments of their life. And, you know, just the sisters who leaves like a review on the website and says that, you know what, I ordered. It's the quality is great. The colors like it looked is what it looks like on the website. I'm just happy. And that's it. Like these are the things that really make me proud as a CEO of a business. Well, that, that's amazing. You know, what? even like I um, do help girls with their hijab and sometimes when they struggle, and you know what, I, I know how that feels when you, they say, like, you you helped me become better with the hijab or you helped me become better with my modesty. It's honestly... It's, yeah, it's amazing. It's a beautiful feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I kind of already asked this, but um, how do you stay competitive with, like, fast fashion brands while maintaining the quality and the integri integrity... integrity ready of your pieces sorry yeah no worries so we actually don't try to be competitive um most people we do have people saying that we are very expensive and we understand we do not try to deny it but the reality is that what what it costs for us to produce i think the gilbeb our gilbebs are the best item some of our competitors will sell their gilbebs for 15 20 dollars that is not even the cost for, for making one of our gilbebs because the product and the craftsmanship and the fact that we do work with, even though we produce in China, we made as many research as possible. We tried our best and we are very satisfied with the factory that we work with that respect workers' rights and health and regulations and stuff. Um, so at the end of the day, the item does cost more so we cannot compete when our product is more costly to produce 
then and our competitors can sell it can sell a final product for way cheaper that it, that's impossible we would have to compromise on our values on our quality and all of that and we just don't want to do that so we really don't try to be competitive we again as i said with the 2022 collection we live in our own bubble we have our own prices we have our own way of working and any sisters that come across our brand loves it enjoys it well she's welcome and if she if she doesn't it's fine we understand we are premium but because we try to be uh, eco-conscious, we have biodegradable packaging. And when we receive item in plastic here in the office in France, we recycle. We try to really work as well as we can to, to respect those values. We do our best. So all of that comes with a price. So yeah, we're not trying to be competitive. We are a slow fashion brand as well. We're, so out of that we have our own schedule we really set ourselves aside because when you're a business it's very easy to be sucked into that run that race towards money profit and schedule and just looking at what the others are doing and th th that whole capital capitalist um, system and we're part of it we can't really fight it so we understand that we have to play the game a little bit because a business does need money to survive and we're not going to pretend that we don't want money. Money is absolutely essential because money allows us to create new products to, for example, in November, we are going to have a pop-up event in Paris that requires money to have to gather sisters in Paris in, in under one space. That's money. We need that money and that money generated through sales. But at the end of the day, we don't want to sacrifice values to gain that money yeah i mean you guys are trying to be like i didn't i never really knew that you guys were like also trying to be like global um friendly as well that's amazing. Uh, we have a section actually on our website we share um in the about us section we share what this what are the steps that we take regarding the this but yeah most people don't really know that about us <laughs> Okay, that's interesting. Uh, how do you balance between staying tr to modesty principles and keeping up with fashion trends? Um, I know you guys said you don't keep up with fashion trends, but what about your modesty principles? How do you stay true to those? It's it's probably the part that takes the most the most time every time we try to do a collection we're always like okay we love this color there's so many colors that we would love to do they were like ah that's that's just not really wearable that's just not doable so we always trying to find a solution like maybe it's more muted maybe if, it, if we make it darker or pastel we just try to find options for sisters to just make it work we do our best that's amazing Allahumma barak my <laughs> fiki um, thank you for your time and thank you for answering all my questions and everything. I'm just going to. It was a pleasure.